I'm going to, I'll slowly start and kick off uh, to welcome everyone to the AA on Zoom. Um, I'm sure you've heard this before, but probably also to welcome you to the static visiting school, which is uh, kind of breaking my heart, but this is going to be another way for the visiting school to operate for the foreseeable future. And I'd like to just welcome you all this evening. Uh, let me do a couple of housekeeping things. Um, before we kind of really get started with the program. One is to say, as I was saying to many of you who were here earlier, you all are muted now. Please communicate with us. Use the chat to the fullest extent possible. I mean, please really engage with us and we'll engage directly back to you. Anna is gonna be monitoring the chat. She's gonna be pulling questions out of the chat in order to kind of introduce and get everyone involved. So please, this is interactive more than anything. I can't stand that you all are quiet. I wish you weren't, but please fill the chat with noise and we'll certainly respond to it. Um, cameras on when you can, please. I mean, right now I've got my screen sort of shrunk so I can see a bunch of you, but we'd love as many of you when you're asking a question or when your question has been asked or in general to keep cameras on whenever you can so that we're much more, more a part of a room and a, and a kind of collective conversation. Yeah. And I think those are probably the two most important kind of points of housekeeping. Um, Animal-esque round table. I wanna say just a couple of things that in these conditions, uh, for most of us animals, I mean, a dog, a cat, a rabbit, or a goldfish. And it's about a pet. And for the next hour or two hours, I just really want us to extend that conversation now. Um, and talk about the broader animal kingdom. And if you're an American guy like I am, uh, middle-aged, you grew up with a man named Marlon Perkins. And Marlon Perkins ran an extraordinary program when I was a child called Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And so tonight, in my mind, we're kind of going back to Marlon Perkins, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. We're gonna look at the much, much broader world of animals and animals in relation to all kinds of things, particularly in relation to the built environment, but also speculatively, imaginatively, and also to a degree practically. Um, there are a couple, or there's a whole group of people behind this program, but I know two in particular, Jorge and Ana, who probably, what did you guys do? You text me, you called me or something about four or five years ago. And we said, we've got an amazing idea for a program that we wanna to contribute to the visiting school. And it's to do with animals and it's the whole world of animals, particularly animals in our cities. It just captured my attention at a time that was really right for me personally, professionally with what I was doing as an architect, but also I thought for the visiting school to expand some of its interests uh, into other areas. And Jorge, Ana and the AA have been working together now for that entire period of time, coming now to producing a competition, which many of you will be aware about, which you'll be aware of, but a competition for short films, which um, Jorge, do you want me to pass over to you at this point to now maybe talk a little bit more about the aims and ambitions of Animalesque, maybe introduce all of us who are here and also talk for a minute or two about that competition. That's right, you are doing very well. So you, you, you can extend yourself for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I just, once I got past Marlon Perkins, I was ready to hand over, yeah. <laughs> You are our Marlon Perkins tonight. <laughs> All right. We are also we're also uh, Sjord and Florentine, um, the extended animalesque. We are now a group of four here in Berlin, and actually we wanted Sjord to present uh, our aims of this competition. So. I yeah. would pass a word to Seward, if Chris, you... That's think. great. Over to Seward. Yes. Right. Thank you very much, Chris, for the introduction. Also, thank you, Manisha, for putting this uh, beautiful round table together. Um, welcome to everybody in the audience. Great that you are joining. Welcome to our panel, which I will introduce uh, in a little, little bit. And uh, yeah, also, of course, to my colleagues, Jorge, Anna, and Florentin, uh, who together with me are the, let's say, core of the Berlin-based Animalesque Visiting School. Um, yeah, since 2018, Animalesque has built a tradition of bringing knowledge together 
um, because we feel that in our work we cannot address the socio-ecological topics that we try to address by design and architecture alone, uh, but that we need a much wider field of knowledge and knowledge exchange to do so. So we started our NMLS quest in 2018 with spring talks in Berlin, where we brought together a wide range of experts on topics about nature and the natural world. And this appeared to be a very fruitful start of unforeseen collaborations. And this is what we have been keep pushing ever since. And I think uh, this round table tonight is another beautiful example uh, we are very happy with this very diverse panel of jurors uh, for uh, this round table, but also uh, for the animalesque city competition that we are organizing. Um, so I will briefly introduce uh, the panel, uh, starting off with Irka Meyer. Uh, she has been an active member of animalesque uh, in Berlin from the, from the very beginning. And she opened to us uh, the world of bees. She's uh, engaged with re reinterpretation of beekeeping in an urban context, which allows for a spiritual connection uh, to be built with the bees and also to develop a more contemporary technique of beekeeping. And currently she is staying in Rome. Um, I keep it briefly uh, brief for everybody because there will be uh, enough to uh, enough time to speak about your work uh, in the conversation later. Um, so Pina Yoldas, she's an uh, infradisciplinary designer, an artist, and a researcher, and her work uh, develops within biological sciences and digital technologies through architectural installations, kinetic sculpture, sound, video and drawing uh, with a focus on post-humanism, eco-nihilism, Anthropocene and feminist techno-science. You have to tell us more about this later, Pina. Um, she's staying in Ann Arbor in Michigan, so all over from the US. Um, Emmanuel Cocha, he's an, uh, he's an Italian philosopher and associate professor at E. H-E-S-S -S in Paris, and he has been supporting and inspiring uh, Animalesque for a long time with his research on the uh, nature of living beings. He published several books like The Life of Plants, Sensible Life, and recently Metamorphosis. Also, Ricardo Riostas was part of, uh, he was part of our first visiting school in Berlin in 2018, where we were working with insects in a laboratory setting. And he brought in the tools of drawing and speculation to take the small scale experiments of the students to a much larger urban scale. He's also a unit master at AA school and director of Nagas de Ostos and publisher of the book Scavengers and Other Creatures in Promised Lands. Then not yet with us, but hopefully he will join us soon, uh, Liam Young. I'm correct. No, you are not here, I think, yet, Liam. Um, no, Liam is not there yet. No. Liam is a speculative architect and film editor operating in the space between design, fiction, and future. And in his recent movie, Planet City, he proposes that the entire population of Earth could fit inside one enormous city, thereby bringing relief to the rest of our Earth. Um, our collaboration uh, with Animalesque and Liam, um, uh, it's uh, fresh and new, but obviously he was directly on our radar when we started thinking about the Animalesque City competition. Uh, well, last but not, not least, Chris Pierce, who everybody who has some kind of connection to AA school uh, must know. Uh, Chris has already, uh, has always been supporting Animalesque uh, from the beginning as the director of the AA Visiting School. And I also remember, Chris, a beautiful uh, lecture that you gave combined with uh, Emanuele Cocha, mm -hmm. where you brought the topic of food to the architect's table. Mm -hmm. So all of you, very welcome. Uh, we are super happy to have all of you here together. Um, I will introduce the, the topic of Animalesque City and the competition, and then uh, Jorge will take over and open the, the conversation. 
So the idea for this uh, competition and the subject of the Animal Esque City was born while we were observing the world during the first lockdown, which is probably the biggest collective experience since the Second World War. Uh, somehow for us, this pandemic is questioning the relationship as well as the separation between the urban and the natural. The Animal Esque City competition was born out of this reflection on the vulnerability of ourselves and the systems we built our societies on. It also comes out of a clear realization that we all share the same very interconnected world and that we need to address the topic with a multitude of perspectives, approaches and experiences. And we feel that film is a strong medium to do bring these ideas alive and to exchange them in our digitalized world. With Animal Esque, we aim to blur the human defined boundary between the urban and the natural. The pandemic made us realize that this discourse is relevant and going on all over the world, but takes very different shapes depending on culture, geography, and climate. Urban landscapes can be seen as a vast net of cultures and societies spanning around the world, occupying and influencing all its landscapes while provoking interactions with all other <coughs> species. <clears throat> so we define the animalesque city not as an eco dream or an utopian or if you want dystopian environment, but <clears throat> as a reality that needs a radical redefinition when it comes to the relation between the urban and the natural maybe more than a redefinition of our physical space and environment, it would mean a redefinition of the social contracts that our societies and communities are built on. But how do we write these new interspecies contracts for coexistence and cohabitation? And, we, and who would write them? The Animal as City competition aims to create and transmit ideas and visions about this reformulation of interspecies coexistence. So now I want to give the word to Jorge to open the discussion further also with our panel and also with the audience later. Great, many thanks. Um, first, Chris again and Manisha for allowing this opportunity. Um, I would just like to mention that this is a sort of continuation from what we had a couple of months ago, I think was the conversation with Shin that was sort of first or a prototype of a round table about humans and non-humans. And uh, it went pretty well, got a lot of attention and I think it opened already a lot of subjects that we are going to touch this evening as well. Um, it's interesting to discuss these things in a, in a, in a format or, or a digital animal-esque format. Um, and as George or Short already mentioned, um, this is already shaping and feeding a culture of talks and conversation that we have developed over the last years. Uh, many of you are our friends, the speakers, I mean. Um, we know from the past, we have met through some of the animal-esque uh, workshops or, or, or seminars that we did before. Um, some of them are friends from former AA times or some other encounters that we had over our professional lives. So it feels pretty much like, like a growing community of people that it's connected to the subject of animals and the idea of pushing for what could be a vision of an animalesque city. And I think this idea of an animalesque city also emerge stronger or in a stronger way um, due to the restrictions that we are actually experimenting now. Uh, normally we were a group pretty much focused on a laboratory life, doing a lot of hands-on work and suddenly we have no access to this possibility. And we are all locked down in our homes. Uh, we are spread in different parts of the world, like in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Italy. So. We, don't, we are missing this possibility of shaping things together, which was also part of our tradition. But bringing the subject of a city and what means this kind of city, a city where through a digital communication that is new, it's already started a long time ago, um, urbanism is extending everywhere and everybody's aware of a kind of 
struggle between the natural world and the urbanized world. And I think to think about or to, to envision the idea of an animalist city has pretty much to do with this actual encounter or this actual confrontation between what is natural and what is urban. And the conversation of this evening um, will lead pretty much into that direction. So I would like to start um, opening to you from your different approaches uh, that merge mainly on, on how creative you are about finding ways to develop this notion of, of engaging animals within urban spaces. So to start thinking or, or to push further this, this idea, uh, our first question came as, what is for you? Uh, I'm speaking for the general panel. What is for you um, an idea or the relation between what is urban and what is natural in the context of this expansionist urbanism that we are experiencing now? And within that, how do you engage through your work the issue of coexistence between different species? This, of course, a very open question. It's also an opening question for all of you uh, that we will develop during the panel. But it would be great that you all can have an answer to that or you all can comment about it uh, in order to enrich really the conversation from all your different approaches. And just to make it a bit more organized, as we are not in the same physical space, um, I would like to start or to get the first answer from someone who has been literally dealing with animals or other species uh, for a big part of her life, and that we had the honor and the pleasure to learn a lot together. So that person is Erika, and please feel free to start with this conversation. Okay, well, I mean, f for me, when I'm doing beekeeping in the city, for example, um, I'm having my hives and it's everything is very controlled. Yeah, you have millions of bees flying in the city, but in the end, um, I somehow have a control about what they're doing, when they're doing what, and I make sure that they're not interfering with the public or interfering with urban space, which they're not supposed to interfere. Um, and here in Rome, now I experience something completely different that you have this huge population of birds that are so strongly connected to the city and they really have an impact into like everyday life. No? For example, um, in the winter months, the starlings, you can see those big uh, clouds of starlings on the sky um, during dawn, which is absolutely fantastic. But at the same time, they're so special and I think they're so spiritual uh, as well, but they're, it's a big nuisance um, for the people who live in these areas where they, um, where they stay overnight, you know, they stay in all those trees overnight and then it's due, the bird shit is everywhere. And for people, they really experience it as a plague. And I ask myself, why, why do they really think it's a plague? I mean, they used to be, there's these beautiful birds and um, they do these amazing formations on the sky. So um, coexistence, I think, is also a part of like, how can we support the city in uh, finding a more human-friendly, bird-friendly way to coexist together? Because, I mean, those birds are here because um, we cut down their habitat in the countryside. So um, they feel safe here in the city. So maybe we should sure to find a way to deal with, with them living here and sharing our space together. Very nice. Who from our panel would like to continue? Ricardo, maybe you. I can see you from here. <laughs> no problem, Jorge. <laughs> uh, Again, thanks, thanks for thanks for having me, everyone. And it's great to follow up from Erica, which is always kind of an inspiration. Is the person with the hands-on? I guess my hands-on is sort of different. I, I'm very interested in the idea of uh, speculating about the future forests from the point of view of uh, cultural blocks, uh, fragmented, exploded cultural ideas which travel through time uh, and are appropriated and sort of 
disturbed by technology. So to speak a common, sort of a more <laughs> intelligible language is, is the idea that I'm fascinated by that perhaps the, 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 the animalesque sits, you know, or the ideas that derive from this encounter of animals is, I think, also an encounter between the cultures, the historical cultures that have been trying to understand animals in traditional cultures, in pre-scientific cultures, uh, and is also in contemporary science and popular culture, you know, through... Uh, for people being sort of a Twitter activists and the sort of a new trends. Um, so I'm, I'm fascinated by, by perhaps, as it was said at the beginning, that the, the animalist city might not be a utopia. And I wonder why would that not be? Because I also find it interesting not to be uh, an utopia. And I think the, the interest is that uh, perhaps because disagreement and danger and sort of uh, unsolvable problems are part of what we are as a evolving uh, group of you know uh, species. So I think it's interesting that uh, when one, when people are speculating about this theme, you know the the entrance, oh, architects are very notorious for being kind of sometimes techno enthusiasts and sort of um, and kind of defend their project to death, no? I would be very interested if projects who kind of also deal with ideas of what, what are the fears, no? What are the confrontations, not just between humans and animals, but also between uh, different ideological factions of how people think the future city or the future of equality should be, uh, not just to play uh, some sort of sense of... Uh, of, uh, of justice savior, but more in the idea that I think that conversation will also pass through this uh, convolution. Or the future forest is also communities who leave the forest and go to cities and bring their tradition uh, and sometimes live on the streets. Uh, the, future, the, the, the future forest is also uh, minings, mining companies who deforest. So the future city, I think the threshold of the of, of that or the future forest um, perhaps is very different from what we enthusiastically think that is going to be a national reserve, no, a park, but also perhaps is not uh, a urban greenery. So I think that there is a, leaves a lot of room for invite for invitation of what are the sort of a cultural blocks that people might appropriate that might create some kind of temporary connections for understanding, creating correlations between certain cultures uh, and animals. I'm a big fan of that book by uh, Account Zero, uh, which is actually, uh, there is a AI system who takes over and instead to take over abstractly takes over, I think it was a voodoo gods uh, the, the avatar of voodoo gods, no avatar coming from the sort of Indian uh, culture. Uh, and I think it was fascinating that as a thought experiment that perhaps the future appropriating from this sort of existing blocks of knowledge, no, uh, in this case, a religious culture and being propelled forward uh, by systems which are information like, you know, AI and other technologies. So, Basically, I, I think that the animalist city might be interesting as an exercise of looking at the sort of dangerous encounters and elements that are not so well defined of what the forest and the city are. Maybe there is a lot more uh, conversations about disconnections and interesting problems that might emerge. And I think that might be, I find that more interesting than, I guess, uh, the sort of pristine solution, not that I don't want, uh, we all after some level of resolution of problems, uh, but I'll be very interested to see uh, the discussion and the conversations also about these uh, unexpected encounters no, that might occur uh, in the either the future forest or the animalist city, and maybe they the same. Yeah, I think that sounds quite interesting to to this conception of the city and the forest, like as something that we left the forest, we move into the cities or we move 
from the cities back to the forests, but how that exchange starts to happen, how that exchange starts to take shape is, is full of accidents and, and, and unpredictable things, as you were saying. Yeah. That takes me back a bit to a conversation we had with Emanuele some time ago, um, exactly about the forest and, and how he understood us as humans abandoning the forest and starting to shape the cities. First having the huts, then building up some villages, then these villages turn into cities, and then the cities start to become a full administrative and productive machinery. And maybe that also touches a lot of your work, Ricardo. And I think that could be a way to, to open the door to Emanuele to talk about it as well. Yeah. I can't see Thank him. Thank there you so much. Know. I have a little bit of um, some uh, kind of problem. I'm not COVID, but uh, I'm uh, <laughs> a little bit sick, so um, excuse me. Uh, thank you so much for having me and inviting me. I would say perhaps I would just tell two stories about, uh, uh, because your uh, 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 first question was, uh, how do you imagine uh, the animalesque uh, question? And taking up what, what uh, Ricardo just said and what you su get suggested about uh, the relationship <coughs> between forest uh, and cities, <coughs> I would tell first of all the first story, which is um, uh, which is a story that perhaps uh, allows <coughs> allows me to to uh, to stress the fact that, that exactly as you said, Jorge, uh, <coughs> the animalesque city is not an utopian city. It's not something that, uh, in a way. Uh, Obliges us to to go in a distant uh, place <laughs> or in a distant time, but in a way it's an attempt to rediscover the original nature of the city. Yeah. And this story is a story which was uh, told a lot of time, but the the last one who uh, told it was uh, Gilles Clément, the, the famous uh, landscape architect or gardener uh, uh, from uh, France, who uh, actually. <laughs> um, Wrote in his uh, uh, in his book called uh, um, uh, uh, "Sharp History of the Garden," uh, this idea that actually <coughs> the city uh, started uh, that is uh, this uh, sedentary relationship to the space uh, started with the garden. So the very first origin of a city is this uh, relationship of fidelity that we tied with plants. In a, in a way, we could say that uh, a city is sort of, uh, of very strange uh, uh, vegetative or, 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 or plant bovarism. We live as if we were plants, in a way, with the same uh, relationship to space that plants have developed. Uh, but that means uh, that, means that uh, in origin, uh, every city is actually a multi-species project. Uh, so there is no human or no monocultural uh, 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 human monocultural city, what is actually our idea, because if I'm asking you what is Paris, what is New York, what is uh, Dakar, or what is uh, uh, Milano, everybody will, will uh, speak about the, <coughs> the population and a couple of uh, buildings, so stones and human beings, which is the precise definition of a desert, because uh, to put together human beings and stones uh, you have a desert, but in a region, a city is actually a sort of uh, very strange uh, and very non-natural, counter-natural association between uh, human beings and other species. So uh, uh, the very first uh, idea, I think, uh, of, of uh, animalesque city is that we have to remember this uh, <coughs> origin, this idea that the city starts as a project of association of human being with plants and of course also animals to live together to share a common space. This would be, I would say the, uh, the oh, this was also during the summer schools uh, with the, those amazing projects by students. Uh, I remember the project uh, that, of, of students who, uh, who uh, try to build uh, uh, structures to amplify the sound of crickets. That was such an amazing project. That, uh, I, I, uh, I, that uh, in a way, witness, witnesses of this, of this idea that every city should be this kind of sharing spaces, project of sharing space with all other animals. And the second story I would uh, like to tell uh, is uh, a story that I already told in the article I wrote about an animalesque city in Vogue, <laughs> Italy. And it's uh, a story <laughs> that 
in a way, uh, stress the fact that to me, but also to uh, many of us. Uh, uh, so just in order to, uh, to uh, add a, a, a short sentence to the first story, what, what, I, what I, in a way, what I meant uh, saying that a city star or was born as an association between human beings and plants, uh, that means that the city is beyond the opposition between the urban and the forest. Uh, so it's something that in a way is already beyond this uh, uh, modern dialectics between uh, what is uh, mineral, what is urban, and what is the forest. Forest uh, is a false concept that we have perhaps to quit or to abandon because uh, in Latin forest uh, means uh, literally what lies outside of something. Uh, so for, uh, forest uh, comes from Latin forest, uh, silva forestis, which means the, for, the, 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 <coughs> yeah, the vegetal <coughs> association that lies at the door of, of the, of the city or outside the city. So literally every time that we are, that we are speaking about forest, uh, we are speaking about a refugee camp for non-human beings. So that's why we have to, in a way, uh, overcome this opposition between the city as a monocultural space for human beings and forest as uh, the space of biodiversity, of uh, non-human uh, explosion of, of, uh, of life and so on. And the city was this project. Uh, at the beginning. So we have to, <coughs> in a way, uh, come back to this uh, core idea. And the second story is to stress that uh, I think that the animalesque city should be also something or an idea beyond the opposition between technocratic uh, uh, and enthusiasm, uh, as, as a, but also beyond this uh, very dangerous to me romantic uh, naturalism uh, to this idea that we have to come back to a, a cabin uh, uh, <laughs> like Thoreau or to come back to a, a live in to, uh, within forest uh, without any form of technological uh, 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 um, uh, 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 modification of the space. Uh, it's dangerous, this idea, because, because in a way it's already a form of racism toward animals because animals do have technology. So it's not, if you, if you, if we, we want to live together with animals, we also, we have to in a way develop a better technology, not to quit technology. And so the story I would like to tell is this uh, very famous uh, project, at least in Italy and in France, uh, presented by Andrea Branzi and uh, uh, Stefano Boeri for, for the, for the um, uh, competition of uh, Grand Paris. So as you know, <laughs> in 2008 or nine, uh, Sarkozy launched uh, this competition about how uh, the, the new metropolis should uh, imagine itself. Uh, and uh, Boeri and Branzi proposed to just to free 5,000 hundreds uh, 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 cows and 30,000 hundreds of, uh, of apes uh, within the city, just to let them uh, circulate within the city with this, with this amazing idea that, uh, I mean, the presence of, the, of those animals uh, will, would work as elastomeric structures. So structures that have to, in a way, change or impede in a way the 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 shock the 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 uh, of of uh, bodies and that in a way obliged everybody to move in a smoother way so mm -hmm. and that's interesting uh, to me because through this gesture through this act uh, the city becomes a sort of of uh, uh, in a way of uh, uh, twice alienated space. So it, it is in a way a space which is no more natural for human being uh, because uh, I mean, it's a space uh, built for human being, but which is uh, <coughs> suddenly occupied by cows and other animals, but it is not even something which is a natural romantic space for cows or, or, or for, 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 uh, uh, for apes. So the idea is that uh, a city, every city should be and sh is and should be should, uh, a, a sort of counter-natural association of beings because it is a voluntary association. So it cannot be in a way an ecosystem in a traditional or romantic way because there is 
love, which, which doesn't exist uh, in, in an ecosystem. So from this point of view, uh, 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 I mean, in the sense that uh, your association with uh, cats or with uh, dogs, uh, it's not just an ecosystem, it's something which is richer than an ecosystem because there is uh, love, that's, there is an excess of, uh, of, uh, of uh, I don't know, of gifts, uh, which in a way uh, 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 overcomes every idea of energetic balance. So from this point of view, I would say that uh, this animalistic city should be also the, the, uh, a, a project of a new way of loving, not just caring, loving animals, loving plants, uh, and put them uh, in a counter-naturalistic space. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's great. When, when you speak about the city as a, as a, as a multi-species project, uh, this also rings a bell of thinking that we are not, um, we have to also go beyond the idea of exploitation of animals, because normally what happens is that we coexist with animals just because of this romantic idea of, of a pet, as Chris was speaking a little bit at the beginning, or because we need animals. We put animals as servants for us, for our needs. So that der derives pretty easy into exploitation. So in this idea of a city as a, a, a multi-species project, it, it also demands some effort from our side. Like, how do we allow other communities to coexist with us? It's like, how we can also be for their service and not just them for us. And I think when, when Erica, for example, she talks about the, the colonies of birds or colonies of bees uh, uh, appearing in the city, all the... the, the, the Hello, Erica? Yes. Yeah, yeah. When you talk about the, the starlings there and that they create and they play and they shape this kind of game that, that becomes a spectacle for humans there, but it's not something that they, it was thought to be a spectacle. It naturally happens as a spectacle because this piece just create that spectacle. So. In that sense, the ecosystem is extend into something that it's also novel, I think. And it can create a lot of myth and it can create a lot of dialogue or interaction with these animals as well. Yeah, so I think for me, I'm, I'm really much more hands on, uh, I must say, but, and I would love to find ways um, of coexistence and maybe even ways of agricultural technique. What yeah. to do with the birds, you know? I mean, can we use, can we find some sort of relationship with them? Like with the bees, we have the relationship that we take care of them and we make sure there's enough food and then we can harvest this delicious honey. So why, maybe we have to get to a point that we also start not only looking at the birds, but kind of in getting them into our needs, you know, using them for something that we can harvest, you know? I mean, I don't know, we can not only harvest the beautiful, um, images of the sky, but we can maybe just get inspired and and find a way of relationship uh, which is a coexistence, but which is positive for both sides. You know, yeah. I mean, it's not that they are up there in the sky and we are here and we're having a trouble because we don't know how to get the streets clean and how to get the monuments clean. And uh, so how can we adapt to them? You know, I think this is very interesting. So for example, there's also the seagulls here in, in Rome, which is amazing. I mean, they're so loud and they're like checking the garbage everywhere. So now the city tries to develop a garbage system that it's basically not uh, seagull friendly and so on, you know? I mean, the city needs to find an answer to, this, to the bird life. And I think this is what I find really interesting here because they're here already. I mean, those birds are here and no one can just chase them away. So we are, I mean, I think Rome for me is so much more like an animal city um, than like Berlin has different ways, uh, different animals, of course. But I mean, in Rome, it's really, um, it's a big population on birds, I would say. It's thousands and it's millions of starlings. And I wish, I wish architecture or like could find a way um, how to, yeah, how 
to implement those yeah. birds as part of the city and that we can just freely find um, inspiration watching them because we know that we're taking it's taken care of you know yeah let's say let's see what pinar says about this millions of birds uh, excess of animals flying over rome thank you jorge and thank you everyone in the panel and thank you listeners for showing up this is a super interesting topic and um I'm going to share an American perspective. I'm actually in San Diego, not in Ann Arbor anymore, which is, I guess, great because Ann Arbor is super cold right now. Uh, I'm in uh, California. Uh, I'll share the American perspective, which is very different. And American cities are very different than European cities. Uh, the approach at the animal uh, or uh, human, non-human animal relationship is very different. And yet I'm not American, I'm Mediterranean. So I find my roots uh, in, let's say, rural Anatolia and the Aegean. Well, uh, I think one thing that we have to really speak about is uh, extinction and uh, that the fact that climate change is real. I'm saying these and not apparently for this audience, these are uh, well-known facts, but again, the American perspective is very different. We still have to fight for uh, uh, making people understand that uh, these things are happening. Uh, there is huge amounts of plastics in the ocean. Uh, in a couple of years, we will be seeing the effects of acidification in the ocean, which will also affect a lot of other ecosystems. Deforestation is a very big problem. Uh, we've lost, I'm going, jumping back to oceans, 90% of top predators which doesn't sound like, oh, okay, you know, they're predators, but it's actually a lot of fish in the ocean. So let's circle back to extinction. If we don't start designing cities differently or altering our cities right now, humans will be the only species and species that kind of adopted to live with humans will be the only species left around. And other things that might not be super appealing to us like parasites, viruses, some insects that bother us, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Anthropocene is the term that we all know. Uh, there are a lot of you know, other suggestions to replace this term, such as capitalocene, chitotocene, et cetera. But one that I like comes from, that I like a lot comes from Edward Wilson, um, yeah, E. O. Wilson. And uh, this is a primarily British audience, I believe. And uh, there will be some other references coming from Britain, like uh, George Monbiot. And E.O. Wilson says that this is not uh, Anthropocene. You should call this the age of loneliness, Erenomocene, because if we go on like this, we will be the only species left. Um, another thing he points out that although we're talking about extinction and we're throwing these numbers, we haven't even counted all the species that exist on this planet fully. I only, we've discovered about half of them. So most of these species will be gone before we can actually even meet them. Now, I'm not gonna go into the intrinsic value of life and how important it is for us to protect these species, etc. But I'm going to come back into uh, the architecture of cities uh, or how cities are functioning right now. Um, we have built, uh, especially I'm thinking about, for instance, an American downtown and or perhaps some suburbs, etc. I'm thinking about my immediate environment around here. I live in California. This is a car city. If you don't have wheels, you're dead. Right, I just can't walk to the grocery store. I have to drive, etc. So this is the kind of structure that I'm talking about. So we have basically built architectures of guilt, architect architectures of isolation, architectures of shame, and cities are uh, have become large projects of imprisonment. Not imprisonment of us ourselves in boxes right, or in other box-like structures, which we call architecture, but imprisonment of other species around us. What really, for instance, pains me is that I take to a walk to the beach. I actually live a mile from the ocean. And I will, uh, every single afternoon, I'll see a couple with their dog and they'll take the leash and the dog is running like crazy after the seagulls. I hate this, by the way, because they shouldn't be actually unleashed. 
but the dog is so happy that it's not caged anymore. So everybody is caged, everybody's imprisoned. I think in a competition like this, what I'd like to see is another approach where instead of repeating what we've already done, and we all know why certain architectures are here, right? We all know why Anthropocene is also called Capitalocene, et cetera. What I'd like to see is an architecture of freedom, a movement towards freedom. Um, I wanted to mention George Monbiot as well. Uh, he's not well known in the States. Uh, I think he writes in The Guardian or something, but I've been uh, reading his books uh, because I was looking into rewilding. Uh, I teach speculative design and I want my students to kind of learn what this concept means. What is rewilding, right? And um, when asked uh, what this project is about, uh, he basically says that this is, a, this is about a more intense and emotional engagement uh, of human beings with uh, non-human animals and other living things, right? So it's actually about us having a much more thrilling and exciting life. Um, we've all suffered from extreme levels of boredom once COVID hit. So I believe this might uh, actually, this feeling of imprisonment might be a little bit more familiar than it actually was. But um, rewilding is not just about building cities uh, that can accommodate other uh, living things, right? Uh, but it's also uh, about us and about us finding our uh, kind of true potential. Um, our, for instance, just think about like working out, we're doing this on repetitive movements, but cities can be designed in such a way that we execute our animal side uh, very, very, uh, very much, uh, very easily. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to end um, with a note. Uh, wherever I look, uh, this could be neuroscience, uh, a little bit of philosophy, design, right, uh, social sciences, etc. There is a great emphasis on the differences between humans and animals. Whereas there is actually, uh, we, share a, we share a lot more things. There are a lot more similarities between non-human animals and us humans, right? And um, starting from the circadian rhythm, that's why I chose the cave fish behind me. It's the blind fish, but they, it has the same circuitry for you know, circadian clock. We need to understand this. And I think as architects who are the builders of the uh, man-made or human-made environment, we really uh, need to educate ourselves on our own animality. Okay. Um, thanks, Pinar. That was quite strong statement also about how to continue thinking about architecture and, and specifically about what is the architecture of, of, of an animalesque city. Um, and a lot of words are coming like movement, freedom, to release this sense of imprisonment, uh, to move away from an architecture of, of isolation. Um, and I think this has to do a lot with what Emanuele and, and Ricardo were also saying, like breaking down the opposition between what is urban and what is natural. Like as soon as we start thinking between the, the relation between, between these two conditions as something that is much more fluent, that is not that there is not a fixed border in between them, we can probably bring this sense of freedom or we can bring this sense of movement. So that comes to the issue of the animalesque city. It's a city that we think about it as a kind of region, as an urban spot or animalesque city. It's a series of relations that are just spread in the world where we find ways of coexistence and where we are not speaking about a fixed or defined um, typologically or archetypically as a place that we can call a city. But it's a new kind of formation that is much more based on this kind of temporary interrelations between different species. And that is probably this common project of multi-species that Emanuele was talking before. Um, I would like to give back the word to Ricardo. Uh, if you can talk about this temporary city as a visionary architect. Uh, temporary city in which way? I mean, I, I can definitely talk about it, but in which yeah. way? As a place that is not fixed in place, 
in a site or it's not fixed in time. That can occur depending on certain activities or certain interactions that you want to reach regarding something, some kind of phenomena that is occurring there. That in this case could be driven by relations that we want to establish with different species. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll, I'll have a I'll have a go at it. I probably go in a bit of a round. Of the, but you know, I think the the idea of forest as elements that, as as other guests have said, of elements that are also unknown, no, and also a place where some kind of a plastic concept, a more plastic concept that we can speculate rather than to be seen as something which is fenced or something which is just portrayed so sort of high definition. Uh, national documentary, ge national geographic documentaries, where you can have a massive zoom in on a beautiful green frog. Um, so I, I think that there there are great lessons that we can learn, and and also to map those places which tend to be to offer different levels of inhabitation. So, for example, the Amazon forest. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about the Brazilian Amazon, but it happens in nearby as well, uh, where a lot of the occupation there is seasonal. You know? So it's seasonal and it's time-based simply because the, the, the river tide and the, uh, and the flow of water in the region. Uh, so you have a massive amount of rain. So uh, the, the river, the Rio Negro, for example, branches in into the land, uh, raising up uh, and creating kind of several new rivers you know, that enter into this kind of vast 100, 200 kilometer areas. So suddenly people uh, before 1940, before 1927, uh, um, uh, people used to have a routine. You know, they used to take their belongings and when the river fill up, people travel to those areas. They got a pass when they flooded uh, and they simply stay there for six, seven months. Uh, and they inhabit that region and maybe they can let the river down when the river flood again, they came back. So it's, it's kind of a, a biannual cycle of things. And we wrote this on the book, on the scavengers book a bit, where uh, so rather than to have that uh, anxiety of a city which is 24 seven, no, a city which is always available, a city where perhaps you always, uh, uh, engaging with the instantaneous of, of the current technology, I, I think one of the multiple aspects is that that offers um, a seasonality that, you know, you might go to a, a, a city which is seasonal, uh, urbanity of occupation that is seasonal, where one might stay uh, uh, 16 months in a place and move to another place and also species do that. No, they got a, the species of Igarapés, they, they're very specific because they, they live out of those uh, dual or triple conditions that occur there. Um, and it's interesting when you move to cities uh, down the river, for example, Manaus, uh, where that city also has some of these characteristics. It has also Igarapé, meaning the area of flood. Um, but unfortunately, instead of bringing species to the river, they bring rubbish. So when you flood, you have a massive amount of rubbish that goes into that area. I mean, I'm telling this story simply because, uh, I mean, the forest is not just a place where species live. No, it's a place where have infrastructure, exploit, extract, uh, and you have also communities and 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 technologies, no uh, natural technologies and cultural technologies, they have learned how to occupy uh, a temporary city, you know, where the urbanity is made out of this kind of radical seasonality and the occupation where streets disappear you know, during six months, where uh, food changes the cycle and the availability of, of a life changes radically. So... I think it's less about looking at those examples, thinking that, as Emmanuel said, and go back to some kind of a pseudo pastoral or pseudo sort of a, um, enthusiast. But I think those elements are also pieces of culture uh, and pieces of know hows, of course, with necessary care and attention to where these things are coming from. Uh, that there are int very interesting engagements that we can have with that because it might. We can therefore speculate, ask what ifs and what nows about 
how would it be if certain uh, we, if we can learn from that radical seasonality that maybe it's not even an annual cycle, maybe it's a 16 month cycle. Um, and of course, there's other more kind of a pressing questions as our colleague just said about the, the amount of uh, plastic, not in the oceans, but on the river in this case. Um, so I'm, I'm fascinated by some of those, extracting some of those elements, speculating upon uh, some what ifs and what nows. Um, of course, having the mindset that there's um, cultures associated with that as well in that area. But yeah, so I don't see forest just as a place with species. I see that as a, in the future forest, the possibility to speculate about several notions and, and, uh, and, and cycles that can occur. Uh, they are already in threshold with existing urbanities. No, unfortunately for the for the bad, as, as this example, this minor example in Manaus. Sorry, yeah. it's a long word. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's interesting what you are mentioning of the animal occupation is something seasonal, right? Like our poster for 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 the round table is a migration of the wild beast crossing Africa from one region to another, and you see thousands of them in this act of migration that happens once a year. So, yeah, not thinking of going back to a kind of nomadic life uh, in the sense of pastoral life, as you were saying, but what could mean this project of, of, of a city that is based on movement, that is based on, on seasonal occupation? Is that something that we can think about? Is that something to put on the project of Animal X City? Emanuele, what do you think about that? <laughs> <coughs> I, I didn't want to make you nervous, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. I'm just, <coughs> I'm just sick. No. Uh, I just want, uh, uh, just a couple of things to ask because uh, I, I, um, I mean, uh, what I meant uh, before, I, <laughs> of course, it's not that uh, <coughs> we have to dismiss forest. Uh, it is that we have to stop calling them forest, uh, stressing every time, every time that we are, in a way, uh, calling them this way, the fact that they are, in a way, outside something. Uh, I mean, it's it's a, a stupid, uh, perhaps a suggestion or pro proposal, but uh, if you are saying uh, about <laughs> any association of uh, of species or of things or a, a technological association of species or things, because uh, I mean, we know, for instance, that the Amazonian forest uh, lies on ancient <coughs> human settlements. <laughs> but we, if we stop to call them forest, if we call them uh, non-human uh, urban spaces, or I don't know if we project on them other kind of uh, um, uh, um, representation per representations or, or idea images, perhaps it's easier to, as Ricardo proposed, to, uh, to, to grasp from them in a way other information, other sets of, uh, of uh, ideas also for our way of life. So, that, that was my, my <coughs> proposal to stop, in a way, uh, to stop to consider nature as something which uh, lies in, uh, in a way, in a very, very far place. Uh, so we speak about forests also in the sense that, uh, I mean, it's not the case of Ricardo when he's in Brazil, but in Europe, forest means uh, Brazil, <laughs> Australia, California, <laughs> and so on. <laughs> there was a very interesting book uh, uh, which came out, came out a couple of years ago in France uh, uh, who proposed to uh, start to start to speak about uh, ordinary nature so la nature ordinaire so the, the idea is that actually we should co start in considering nature as something which which lies exactly <laughs> I mean uh, near our home or our or our school or our, I don't know, the buildings we are living in or we, inside the buildings we are living in and started to create a new, in a way, new, uh, uh, new uh, uh, 
a new relationship with, with this very, very close forms of uh, non-human uh, 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 forms of life. Uh, and from this point of view, to my, to my opinion, the, <coughs> the question is uh, not just uh, not just a, a movement, but it's uh, to find a way of, of uh, a pleasant uh, <coughs> conjunction or a contiguity between, uh, between uh, or among uh, <coughs> many species. The other question about mobility is perhaps another question, uh, a totally different question is the fact that uh, actually, but this is this implies actually a, a very strong critique to the ecological tradition which uh, has to be made uh, because uh, um, in a way the ecological scientific tradition uh, still uh, implies that uh, uh, that every species <laughs> is living within uh, its own uh, habitat within its own uh, <coughs> home uh, oikos uh, and from this point of view ecology is a very strange doctrine of uh, universal and global confinement. So in a way, the, the idea that uh, every species uh, possesses its own uh, natural environment uh, is a very dangerous one. It's a very, in a way, reactionary idea because it, in, your, <laughs> in a sense, it impedes to recognize to every species also the right of moving away all the time. So, and also this idea is very, very, to my opinion, a stupid idea of the distinction between uh, uh, um, invasive species and autochthonous species. Uh, it's uh, a very common idea, which is which I, which had uh, a huge success in the uh, in I mean in the political <laughs> scene and the scene of the political ecology. But the origin of this idea is a very obscure one, or a, a very strange one. Uh, and actually, it's the projection of, uh, I mean, it comes from uh, the work of uh, a, a British uh, botanist of the 19th century, who, in order to classify and to produce the first British flora, he just took the categories of the common law and he applied them to the, <coughs> to the, to the plants. And so he distinguished uh, citizen, denizen, alien, and so on, but related to uh, uh, vegetal beings. Uh, and starting from this work, uh, people started to speak about autochthonous <laughs> and invasive species. Uh, and it's a very strange form of counter-totemistic <laughs> thought. So we are just asking plants and animals to, uh, uh, to behave like good citizens of the 19th century Commonwealth empire, which is totally stupid in a way. So it's uh, so the, from this point of view, <laughs> we have to change, of course, our political uh, uh, representations, but uh, we also have to change a lot of stuff within ecology. So sometimes or very, very often, ecology is the problem and not uh, the solution to our problems. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, because yeah, you are right. I mean, ecology tends to to classify and to singularize and to give the sense of protectionism. Uh, no, the problem is not just uh, classifying. The problem is that uh, ecology, in a way, start also. I mean, uh, it's very strange that nobody uh, that we we in a way we gave the name or we still name the science about the, the, the relationship of all the species on the earth, uh, ecology, which means the science of homes, uh, the science of domestic space, uh, because why should all species live within a home? So we are experiencing exactly now the fact that to be at home all the time, uh, it's hell. It's not it's not, uh, I mean, it's not the paradise on the country. So, and we are projecting on the life of human species, this very stupid idea of being at home, uh, staying at home, and not just uh, two months, three months, two years, all the time. So in a way, it's, it is if, is, it is if, if ecology uh, 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 
would think uh, the world uh, as in a state of uh, permanent pandemic uh, lockdown. So it's it's uh, and that that is all. I mean, I could uh, it's it would be too long. I could uh, to- tell you why the first uh, the first uh, treatise about ecology choose this name, and it it was uh, not even ecology. It was economy of nature, but it was I mean uh, a choice of those time, and nobody decided to change the name, to change, and not just the name, to change the representation linked to the fact that there are a lot of species who are living together, but they have not, they are not obliged to organize this space as if they were in a domestic space, because the domestic space, first of all, is not the only form of uh, sociability, and it's not the most <laughs> interesting one. So we should speak about other, I don't know, we should take other images, uh, plays, market, I don't know, perhaps a museum, uh, which are better than home. So from this point of view, we have a lot of, from this point of view, the, the idea of animalesque city is interesting, but also to play it against uh, ecology, yeah. because city is much interesting than a uh, home. So perhaps uh, the world is an animalesque city and not, and not an oikos and not at home. Exactly. I think I think that's that's probably where we are pointing, and this is the, the subject that I see now that it's kind of opening quite well. That that to to leave behind the idea that that an animalesque city is just providing a home, but it's more like providing a series of new relations, a series of new interconnections, of, of forms of exchange between different species, uh, because this is going to happen anyway. Now uh, it's very hard to think that species are going to be clusterized in one single space. Or in one single place, yeah. So this dynamicity—it's kind of inherent to the idea of, of talking about an animalesque city. Maybe it's a good moment to open to a few questions of the audience. And here is uh, Aitor, who is actually asking a question uh, that, in his opinion, uh, what what's the biggest obstacle? He's asking the the podium. What's the biggest obstacle that is preventing us from reaching alternative ways of cohabitation with, within the urban context? Is it the econ- economy or educational one? And I wanted to add uh, also: is it also um, a problem of how to actually increase our audience? We architects are often kind of staying within our own. Uh, audiences, uh, this, this panel is probably not the example, we are more than 100, but exactly, what's the problem? Why we are, what's the obstacle of not being able to do the alternative ways of cohabitation? I mean, I can offer, hopefully my, my our, everyone can tip in, uh, but I, I think that in a way, I don't want to sound negative or sort of uh, self-serving, but I think is 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 at the moment is interesting that we haven't, and uh, and to some extent I think it's maybe even good that we haven't because I think that perhaps this is a project that it shouldn't be seen as as kind of the next total project. No, I think that that is less interesting. I think it's more interesting that can we offer in. Uh, a rich to start kind of conversations and we put the experiments that we do from speculations to visions to prototypes to projects and are we able to share and say things where uh, what was hyped on the blog or on the on the on the marketing campaign are we able to say that these projects fail after three four years you know after some some interesting projects with great intentions about enhancing biomass or are we, do we have that open conversation to say in kind of an experimental economy that's classical, no? or, or in kind of experimental architecture, I hope that's interesting as well, where one can say, well, look, this project failed, fail, and we can learn from this now. I find that uh, that answer, interest, or that thought interesting, because I think that leads to the question of, is it education? Is it about in increasing the audience. Uh, and I think education passed through it, but hopefully education, the, it, it passed and it changes when other people tip in. 
other people with different points of view that are different from yours, they are going to bring different things to the conversation of, um, I guess he's talking about the animalist city as some sort of uh, positive environment where humans and animals live in some level of coexistence and encountering each other. But I think that I'm very interested to stay on the basement of the conversation to some extent where we can, as architects, as collaborators with zoologists, philosophers, everyone else, when we can have open conversations that uh, we can reassess projects a few years later and to see what went wrong, you know, what didn't go as expected. Because I think that will create more awareness for, for these things not to be another hyped where academics get tired after three or four years of those terms, recycle, get a new passion, a new kind of uh, new book comes out and they sort of uh, assimilate new things. So anyway, long story short, I, I yes, it passed through education, not to educate, to tutor people, but actually to the ideas to change. And he also passed through the economy, but not to scale the economy, actually to understand the failures of the economy of means of the project. Uh, and yes, it passed through audience, but not to sort of uh, manipulate the audience uh, through algorithms, but maybe pass through audience to, again, as the audience, as a, as a changing critic for the idea. So, uh, you know, as some people say that technology is, uh, is the future is already here, but it's not evenly spread. Um, I think there is a lot of great, great possibilities there, but uh, I think there is an open conversation to be done about these this elements of efficiency and how do one measure or understand a certain level of uh, critical success or interesting experiments or interesting failures. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Liam. Yeah. Hey, Liam. Jorge, let me jump in for a minute. Liam, you, Ricardo, and I have been together for a while. Do you agree with what he's saying? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Terrible. I didn't think so. Yeah. Sorry, I, I just I just joined, so I missed most of what he's saying. I'm sure it was terrible though. But um, uh, uh, so I, so you'll have to you have to you have to give me a pricey or a summary in order if you want me to respond intelligently. Um, <laughs> Ricardo, can you give him a pricey? <laughs> no, no, wait, wait, wait. Um, I think it's it's more um, it's more something of can I become part of an uh, of an animalist city? Am I an animalist citizen? You know, do I allow myself to build up a relationship with animals that are around, or do I need to buy a, a dog to build a relationship with an animal? Or can am I open enough to walk through the city and to appreciate all those animals that are around me and to start building a relation and then? I become part of an animalist city myself, you know? And I think it's also, for me, the project is more a constant motivation in asking myself and trying to kind of put myself into a sort of interspecies relationship when I'm walking through the city, you know? I mean, it's, it's down to everybody's own person, I think, if you take... A, take on the city as an animalist city like I did in Berlin with uh, with doing the beekeeping. It was amazing because I would live in the city, but I would live my animal animalist city life together, sharing it with, with animals on a constant basis, on a daily basis. And I would have enough time and passion to, to share it because you have also have to include animal life into your citizen life somehow. No? I mean, do you have time or the space or do you find them? Do you see them? Where do you experience them? So I think it's a lot about the relationship you, you're able to build up with something you don't own, let's say, you know? a part of nature that's around you and you have to kind of acknowledge first. So this is probably also education, but it's also, um, it's also a, a mindset, I think. So just... Yeah, like so, sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm just joining. I have no idea what the format was, and I'm sure everything good has already been, been, been said. Um, uh, but I guess um, what I was thinking about in the context of the animalist city was that um, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, I, 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 
agree with the the sentiments just placed about like putting some of the onus on us to put ourselves in in certain relationships. But but my the reason I was intrigued by the topic was because it sets in motion a, 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 a much larger discourse about what we do as designers or architects. And specifically, I think the beginning of the animalesque city is the end of human centered design. Right. Like like we, we often use that phrase as designers or architects. Um, and it normally comes associated with images of tree lined streets and cafes spilling out onto sidewalks and it's seen as being something that we should be doing somehow. But in many ways we've had our time in the sun and thinking about a process or a practice that decenters the human as the subject of the things that we're designing for and around is now more urgent than ever. Um, because I'm no longer interested in human centered design, which in many ways has been co-opted by um, companies and technology companies is now kind of morphed into user centered design, which inevitably is customer centered design. I'm much more interested in what like whooping crane centered design might look like or wetlands centered design or even you know hard drive centered design um, is of interest to us lately. Like, like what does it mean for architects to entirely jettison the idea clients and start designing for you know atmospheric centered design designing for levels of carbon or clean air um, and ultimately you know we we acknowledge that sometimes humans move or pass through the structures that we make but but how can we privilege and, and totally upend the hierarchy um, that suggests that you know all of the language of architecture the poetics of spatial occupation that we've been trained in that's been part of the discipline for generations. What does it mean to abandon that um, or at least evolve it to start thinking about designing for different kinds of subjectivities and clients and, and architecture without people, um, I think is a really interesting question for us to all be exploring. Probably already said all that, but anyway, here I am on the Zoom call. No, that's that's kind of narrowing down into. Um, I, I would take the, what Erica said that that you have to somehow open your yourself, or you have to include the animal life within your own life, within your citizen life. That is somehow the animalist project, and and or part of an idea or a conception of the animalist project. And then when Leon talks about a form of design that is not purely human centered, but it, that it involves animality or in a way of this. Hey, uh, Jorge, do you have it any cross with how do I Jorge, I just wonder, do you have any idea how we pick up the people with their hands up in the air? Anna, mm -hmm. can you do that? Yep. I don't know, but I see I see someone there yeah, asking Tomiris, a question. But how do we get in touch if with you, her? If you want if you want um, them to ask a question, just tell me who to unmute and I will. Oh yeah, so un unmute Tomiris. Tomiris Batalova. Mm -hmm. I probably butchered that name, but I'm sorry, Tomiris. Hello. Hello. Um, I did an uh, years ago. Uh, <laughs> visiting Hello. school. I really enjoyed it. It was uh, um, I'm very interested in the topic. And I just wanted to um, know, like to listen on your thoughts on the importance of a one-to-one -one relationship with the animal. People who do farming outside the city, they're generally more integrated with the animals and have a deeper understanding about the value of animals' life, even when it comes to consumption. Uh, and I just wanted to open up a question on uh, that, this importance of whether it, in the future there is a could be a possibility of interacting with the animals, maybe virtually. Yes, I, I personally dream of an architecture department with animals in them. And the first architecture department uh, in, uh, in, uh, in 2021 with, uh, with insects and, uh, and bees and mice and stuff like that. You remember our visiting school? And, and, and it makes me uh, think about the, you know, the 90s and the, the end of the 80s when the first schools with computers and stuff like that. So dreaming about this. As, as a first step, but we, Animalesque, we're here uh, located in a building 
where we we basically do have a lot of animals around us. Uh, it's it's called Lobe Block, and uh, we have chicken and and guinea pigs, and all the people who are in this building have uh, have dogs. And I th I think it's very important to surround yourself uh, with this uh, real real animal life, and then it's a it's a kind of a different experience of life. Definitely. Well, although well, I, I I totally agree, and I'm I'm really sympathetic to, to any of your point and and Erica's and and then Jorge's follow up. What what I also want to do is just put in a note of caution to say that, like putting the emphasis on the scale of the individual and the individual's relationship to to animals is is deeply problematic. In, 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 not at the exclusion of that, but but in the same way that the the fossil fuel industry has trying to be has created the language of like the carbon footprint right to try and put the responsibility of co2 emissions on us as individuals when actually the real issue is massive systemic change that's required in the entire industry at large so i mean just like tamiris discussed farming like i think it's much more interesting to talk about like massive scales of mega agriculture and how we can kind of reposition our relationship to that, which currently exists either on the periphery of cities or on the certainly on the periphery of our consciousness. What does it mean to kind of embed other practices and programs within industrialized agriculture as an animal-less city? You know, like it's easy to fall into the romanticization of like, you know, walking your zebra um, around in your backyard or something, right? But like, let's like really talk about how animal cultures have been totally planet industrialized on a planetary scale and that an animal ex city somehow needs to engage with that not the mythology of the local or the impossibility of of just staying within that kind of romantic intimacy but like big stuff like what does it mean to share a city with four thousand head of cattle you know um uh, as opposed to like you know uh, a wall of flowers and 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 backyard bees i think um, both con both sides of the conversation are, are important but but often the industrialization of the animal gets lost in favor of the romantic and the picturesque sure there is another question from uh, michelle collis can she be unmuted thanks um uh, hi, um, I'm just feeling really perturbed. I missed the first five minutes, but um, as as a designer, and um, like because I've designed like these like kind of stairs that roll out that are like armadillo esque or, or or aspects of personalities or understand um, from say like an anthroposophical point of view or even a story tale uh, or myth mythological. Um, lens um how much there is to learn from animals but um having said this and i don't know if it's just because of where i live it's uh i, I feel quite disturbed by the conversation in some in some ways and i don't know if it's there's a particular theme that i'm missing out on or, or what there is but um because because I live in Africa and uh, and so we're surrounded by animals. I've, yeah, I've had the like grace of being surrounded by animals uh, of all diversities quite a lot and quite a lot of them. And I think what hasn't seemed to come up arrive out of the conversation is um, nature's various kingdoms are like the way animals arrive is through in a way through succession. And it starts, I mean, it actually started with Gondwana land, but it starts with like a very intense geological uh, change, which then creates a layer of soil, which with hydrology, major factors hydrology, together makes a plant, which then gets the bees and the insects, which then gets the larger mammals, which then allows us to be around. Um, and so it's like, Animals are um, a reflection of the ecology that happens. They're not, they seem to be quite like cute and Disney-fied. Um, and I'd love to 
have a relationship and often we do i've had moments with like a dragonfly that i sit and kind of s- stared into its eyes for five minutes um and real moments where you know or people have you know the car moments but actual animals like and i've uh, i'm a surfer i've been very close within a meter of a whale and swam with a part of dolphins and things like that but then you kind of you reach out to these dolphins and they like these languages had all happening in the water and everyone's got their own space. Nobody's cute or together or anything like that. Animals operate very differently in the wild. And when they're interrelated, they're not um, a domestic animal from an ecological situation is, is, is so vastly different. And it's very rare actually where these kind of individual relationships occur. I think there's a presence that we understand of each other, but I, the kind of talking and the tease, I mean, I'd love to do that. And it's, it's amazing and it's rare. And, you know, in certain circumstances it's happened, but one of the primary things we're looking at here is climate change and extinction. And it's, they can't be a talk about animal city without a biological city and understanding how it's all integrated because the animal is like the fruit. It's like the reflection of the biology that's arrived. So, I mean, I think it's like amazing that people are starting to talk about whatever mushroom concrete and bacteria and different things but unfortunately each chain needs that thing so a bird needs insects and and in order for something to eat that bird um it needs like so a bigger mammal needs the bird to eat and the bird needs the greens and it needs the insects and whatever so there's this chain so there's, there's got to be a diversity and a healthy diversity within a very close-knit web so I don't know, it's just, and then if everything has a time, a season, which completely would change a city. It's like when you go on a game drive or something, animals just have their own time. You can't say they, they rock up at sunrise, they don't. They do this, they don't. Everything just has its moment in nature or kill or something. It's it's like humans have got nothing to do with that. In fact, what we're trying to do is actually create environments that prompt that and allow that and facilitate that. And then to me, you can start talking about animal behavior and an animal city and possibilities for facilitation or intersectionality with animals. Because in a sense, I think what's happening here is in a way we're talking about intersectionality because um, unless they're domestic, it's not a relationship in that way. So it's intersectionality and it's intersectionality through these various systems, which are very clear. If you go... On a, on a hike with a geologist, hydrologist, uh, marine biologist, biologist, whatever. They all got their own piece and it all very sensitively, highly, uh, highly dependent chain. So I don't know, I, I feel that there needs to be a discussion about intersectionality and, and the way that timing, a certain level of timing also, I think everyone loves time topic spaces and just time in general <laughs> with the industrial revolution and nature's time are something so fundamentally different often and um yeah i don't know for me if you want to talk about animal city it it, it, it can't be divorced without time and the intersection of thriving biodiverse layered architectural spaces because otherwise it, it can't hey. be- yeah. Jorge and Anna, how, do, how does Michelle's point kind of fit into your perspective on the animalesque city? I mean, yeah, we we're definitely working a lot through observations, observations, prototypes, and really time is something that uh, is extremely important because we leave our um, work to be taken by the nature and we look at it and and it's a lot also being patient and and checking and sometimes it's a surprise because for example we our first visiting school uh we have been uh knitting uh, nests uh thinking that they will be taken by the bees uh, by the wild bees and at the end we had birds there and then the birds brought other insects, and and it's exactly what are you to- what you're talking about. It's always a, an ecosystem. Yeah, I like the fact that, that Michelle wrote that it's animals are a reflection of the ecology or the biology that is happening. Um, I think we cannot 
she's totally right. We cannot detach the idea of the animal in relation to the environment that where this animal or this community of animals live. And, and, and we cannot also speak about a, a singular animal. We are always talking about some sort of chain of animals, like the, a, a larger interaction between different species. But I think this is pretty much on the discourse of animalesque. This is what we are trying to rise. Uh, and that also touches what Liam was saying before, that, that it's more important to speak about the massive systemic changes that, that, that animalesque city should involve than the romantic idea of the relation with one single animal. So in that sense, uh, in my understanding, brings totally the idea that we are talking much more about a sort of biology or a sort of biological relations than singular species in an abstract sense. Hey, Jorge, I was gonna ask, there's a M Miguel, I don't know where Miguel is out there, but I, I knew I'd find a way to get Liam and Ricardo talking together. And Miguel's question in the chat has has got to initiate that. Ricardo, have you seen it? No, I didn't see any questions on the chat, Chris. No. Okay. What is so there's a question from Miguel on the chat. Miguel, are you around here somewhere? Can you put your hand up and maybe we get you to just ask the question to these guys? I can. Yeah, I have his question. Sure. Wait, there he is. Are you there? Yeah, Money J, can you un unmute Miguel? Maybe we get Erica, Manuel, Ricardo, and Liam talking. It's a good question. Oh, well, hi there. Thanks a lot for the such an insightful event. My question is more like um, for the general public. Uh, I have the feeling that we are always under the influence of these big tech guys, right? So we are thinking we are talking about like going to Mars or colonizing the moon or things like that. So these images of the future that are being offered to the general public, uh, they are mostly like outside the earth. And then we are actually talking about new relations here in the planet, right? So my, uh, the, the other thing that I'm always asking myself is, is like, um, we accepted that big tech is always in, uh, a work in progress. Uh, so it's not a finished design. And as Ricardo said, uh, it's, um, a little bit like uh, accepting that our plans might, might fail or they might evolve. They are not going to be like finished uh, designs. So why not try to uh, make the general public understand that uh, urban projects and architecture is an ongoing project? So, uh, for example, if we are talking about like uh, having a huge uh, amount of animals uh, roaming around the city. so. Is it going to work? We, we don't know. So um, to, uh, we have to prepare the, the, the general public to accept the idea of trying, right? So this is something that I've been uh, trying to work in, uh, uh, on these ideas, but uh, I wonder if you have anything to say about that, like uh, the influence of big tech and the changing nature of uh, the, the questions that are being raised here. Thank you. Um. I'll answer, I don't know if Leon's back, I'm sure he's gonna be back someone. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a very interesting question. I think there's something that I guess, the, the we disc I discovered that a, a, a bit, a few years after in the career, uh, t teaching at the AA and trying to do projects related to speculations of culture and environment, is that the, the collective, uh, we also, we normally tend to value in architecture projects which are built for obvious reasons. No, you can kind of uh, uh, test, you can uh, proof a lot of things when you build a project, but uh, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, we also discover that the, that we have a capacity to influence the, or, or to contribute perhaps in a minor scale to the collective unconscious. I, of how we share images and speculations that people might aspire to or simply going to share on Pinterest or just, you know, do whatever people do with their five seconds attention span. But there is, there is an element of by creating certain speculations and, and having the effort of layering that, not just easily saying this is another utopia uh, because it's easy to digest that. It's easy to get published on that. But I think it is, 
the idea that these projects, uh, the or speculative projects, meaning that you you ask what if question, questions, and is that they actually start communicating or my assumption is that they they can perhaps communicate to the public a certain risk understanding of risk and uncertainty about certain issues know that rather than certainty of optimist of techno optimist uh, or you know we're going to get the job done this is the app for it you know you know robots who walk with plants in your flat i mean yes maybe that's what the plant wants but who knows um so I think the idea that uh, that the, that task of speculation, creating projects that also will stimulate a conversation, and also maybe I'm over optimistic, can also influence the idea of risk aversion of people to change. It can influence the the ideas that each one have a kind of a risk aversion to different things. No, um, so I think that these projects also have that, uh, and we. We also are part of educational systems or systems of propagation of culture that tend to reward a clear narrative. No, not a very complicated narrative that is going to say, look, this is not the answer. This is one potential answer for a problem. But let's let's read the, uh, the potential downfalls of these ideas and what can go wrong. Um, so uh, yes, it is a matter of education, and is also that idea that that we can resist uh, simply uh, implementing the latest technology from VR to AR to to sort of uh, um, to replicate ideas which are just kind of being recreated by different dresses. No, so. To conclude, sorry, I'm sure other guests want, also want to contribute, but I'm fascinated by by this hope or this possibility that by creating speculations, one can also educate by the idea of certain risks and, and maybe move the, the needle of risk aversion to certain types of projects to different ways. And of course, that built projects also have a role on that, on the proof of concept, etc. Um I didn't touch much on the tech, but I'm sure Liam or someone else can can touch on that as well. Yeah, look, uh, all all architects are utopian, right? Like all traditional architects, whether you, whether they would like to think it or not. Like, no one can go into a client meeting and say, "Hey, I've got this great idea. It's going to be so dystopian and total shit. You're going to love it." Or this mythology that failure is somehow part of people's process. It's just bullshit. You know, you can't go to a client and say, yeah, I want to try this thing about these animals in the city. Not sure if it'll work. It's about, it's about $4 million, $5 million, but you know, let's, let's try it. See what happens. You know, failure is cool. Um, we always learn from failure. Bullshit. It's, it's, it's just a one more fantasy of the genius architect as artist. Um, that said, like, uh, and I guess what you, Ricardo's uh, talking about is that, the, the project whose end point isn't trying to somehow convince someone to, spell, to spend a million bucks on something, um, the speculative project, the end point being the fiction in itself, can actually provide space for failure, um, can test stuff out. Um, and the very definition of a, of a critical, interesting speculative project is not some kind of prediction of a future that might come to pass, but rather it's the pre presentation of multiple alternatives so that we can try things out. You know, the, the speculative project is a kind of site that is risk-free and a lot bloody cheaper than like, you know, remodeling an entire city around uh, a, a bunch of beehives. So um, I think there's a role in speculation in that sense, really just to prototype ideas before they become real um, as a way of testing things. Um, and I think that's also something that big tech, uh, you know, to try and segue into the, the other half of uh, Miguel's question, it's also something that big tech doesn't do enough of, at least doesn't do enough of publicly, right? Like the supply chain of technology means that you, you bring something into the world as soon as you think you can sell it to someone because the people who are invested in its development want to return. Um, you know, it's it's... Driverless cars, for instance, are coming whether we like it or not. Automotive companies and tech companies have spent billions across the last 
10, 15, 20 years even, if we decide as architects, you know, I don't go into an architecture school now without seeing the driverless car studio or something. If we decide as architects that, ah, oh, shit, actually, it was a really bad idea. These driverless cars are totally going to fuck the city. Um, they're not going to like put the genie back in the bottle and decide that, ah, oh, you know what, where billions of dollars is, don't worry, thanks for the research. Um, uh, you know, get behind the wheel again. Um, we should be having those speculative conversations. We should be in the room of, of those companies like way back um, a decade ago when they were deciding uh, to, to, to re-gear their, the economy of their businesses around it. Um, so, you know, involving foresight and long-term planning and speculative projects in the very genesis of how technology makes it into the world, I think is um, a key generational shift that that needs to happen and that that's also like systemically about how engineers are trained you know what does it mean to like for an, just like architects we, we we do classes in structure but we also do classes in philosophy um i don't know if they teach like Foucault in engineering school but maybe like there's parallel programs that, that that mean that the engineers that are literally making cultural choices about the futures of our cities actually have um uh, either collaborations in place or a, a knowledge of, of the cultural implications of what they're doing. Um, you know, it's a sprawling answer, but hopefully there's something useful in that. <laughs> I'm used to this. Hey, Jorge and Nana, if you don't mind, <clears throat> we've been going for about an hour 45. I think it'd be worth drawing it to a close. Is there anything you want to say before I just finish with one point? Uh, actually, a question to you would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be nice at all listen guys we're rolling down down to we, we've kind of divided our audience at about half now let's wrap it up but i was going to wrap up um i was going to propose a question to the two of you actually by by contrast and with a little anecdote about five years ago i was interviewed by national geographic and the question posed to me is what was the animal on the planet that terrified me the most and i took a minute to respond and my response was the clothes moth. And I just want to know where the clothes moth fits in animal-esque city. Where is Anna here? She's super welcome to answer that. <laughs> I, I think uh, they also have their ecosystems in all our, in all our important, now, especially now in the winter uh, with all the wool and cashmere. <laughs> around so they're definitely i just enjoyed Anna, i enjoyed listening to emmanuel talk about domesticity my house is a terrifying place based on the number of clothes moss inhabiting my closet and consequently i just wanted to kind of in a way guys there have been so many ideas shared this evening so many different perspectives it's been wonderful to get friends of mine my goodness, back together and all of you together who we haven't seen one another in person for a very, very long time. But I think, Emmanuel, back to the time that we spent together in Berlin, uh, Anna and Jorge, Liam, Erica, Short, all of you, thank you immensely for being here this evening. I'm going to close this, or I think Money Jay will close this now, actually, won't you? Money Jay? Yes, she will. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Yeah, always nice to have a bit of a surprise <laughs> conclusion. Um, I guess uh, it's been a really amazing discussion. I've been in the background listening to it. And um, we had so many amazing questions sent in. And so while we didn't have time to answer all of them, they have been passed on um, to Animalesque and will hopefully shape um, the future of what's going to come out of this competition and future conversations. So thank you, everyone, for joining. And um, yeah, I can't wait to see what, um, what gets submitted for the competition. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Yeah. See you soon. Thank you a lot for sharing this space, Mania. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.